All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so hello everyone, I wanna thank you all for coming and showing your support to these two amazing authors and for showing your support to the Rise Walk Bookstore. My name is Carrie Bevan and I am the Receiving and Customer Order Specialist at the Rise Walk Bookstore in Winter Park, Florida. I'm here today to introduce these two incredibly talented literary fiction authors. Talking to us today will be Adam Levin, whose newest book, Bubblegum, is out now in paperback. Um, in conversation will be Nathan and Glander, whose newest book, Kadash.com, is out now in paperback. So let's kick this off to Adam and Nathan. Hello. There we go. Split screen. Hey, Adam, uh, see, uh, this is a real, I love this book, but we'll talk a lot about the book. But uh, uh, what a pleasure. This is our first virtual yes. meeting. It's great to meet you. Yeah. I'm a, like I've, a, I've, been a, I've been a big fan of yours. I, I, uh, I, I, it's, it's straight. I mean, I, I think I, I first read you 20-ish years ago, maybe a little. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, it's, so it's, it's uh, yeah. Oh, uh, so nice to meet you. You're like, when they said you were doing the event, I was like, I thought he was dead. Yeah, they're like, no, he's still, still with us. Um, anyway, really my pleasure. Uh, so excited to meet. It's like a Tinder date with everyone watching. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, sh we should dig in. Um, yeah, I will, uh, I'll do like a two line more introduction for you, but Adam Levin is the author of The Instructions and Hot Pink. He's been a New York Public Library Lions, uh, Young Lions Fiction Award winner. We love our young lions and our, I miss those lions. Um, actual and award-winning, a recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship and a National Jewish Book Award finalist. Um, a longtime Chicago Chicagoan, Levin currently lives in Gainesville, Florida, but um, you can, uh, yes, take the writer out of Chicago, but um, this book is uh, chock full of Chicago feeling. Um, so yes, I want to talk about that too, but um, Oh, I get to make a joke. Would you first give us a taste of bubble gum? Anyway, do you want to read for a second? I always like sure. to hear, I always, I just like to hear, it's just nice to hear an author's voice. I have, uh, and by the way, for all of you readers, this is like, um, um, those are the two questions that didn't make it. I put in all the stickies and then I remove um, all the ones. Anyway, uh, I've spent so much time with Adam's voice in my head and now it's gonna, uh, like, it's gonna utterly alter right now when I hear it. I'm about uh, to ruin forever. it. Forever. Yeah. yeah, anyway, I'm excited. <laughs> So yeah, Give I'll, us read, test, uh, please. I'll read a, a very short thing. It's from, it's from early in the book. So I don't think there's a lot of context. I wrote down what context is needed. Um, and it looks like the only context that, that's needed is that uh, the narrator, who's a 38 year old man named Belt has just been given um, an individually wrapped log of double bubble bubble gum by the owner of the white hand pantry as a sort of peace offering, which so I'll read for a minute or two. <clears throat> By the time I chewed it soft enough to blow a good bubble, there wasn't any sweetness left in the gum. Probably that was metaphorical for something. I didn't know what or how to figure out what. As I sat there smoking though, I felt myself verging on insights. Gum, I was thinking, was an old timey product. And I suppose that in its early days, back when the practice of professional dentistry entailed little more than extracting black teeth from rotted out jaws. It was understood simply to be a soft candy. Its job was to continually sweeten your mouth for longer intervals of, intervals of chewing than other soft candies, such as caramel or taffy. This old tiny gum was not, I suppose, nearly as elastic as the gum of today. And I suppose the elasticity a piece of it possessed would be greatly depleted, if not entirely lost, as soon as you chewed all its sweetness away that once it went bland, it rapidly stiffened. And if you kept chewing, you'd weaken its integrity until it came apart in rigid stringy bits that caught in the creases of your throat when you swallowed. But then I suppose double bubble was invented. And what made it different wasn't its flavor, which was just as basically sweet and short-lived as the flavor of any other brand of gum, but its extra chewability. It started more elastic than the other brands of gum and maintained its elasticity for dozens of minutes beyond the loss of its sweetness you could keep on chewing for a really long time. So what though, why should you? Why continue chewing? If the sweetness was gone, what incentive did you have? I'll stop there. Um, yay, I clap for you on behalf of everyone. Um, oh, uh, I really have 97 hours of questions. It's the only way I can sleep before an event and when I get excited about uh, a book. Anyway, there's deep dives. 
if we have time, I'll ask you about your background at the end. I'm skipping all of those, but I do want to hear about all of that. Uh, and really, uh, I will back up to the book. But oh, you know what? I'm going to jump right to the middle. But back to those kind of riffs, which the book is filled with. It takes real, like, uh, it is not, um, it's just beautiful writing, but there's just so many of these riffs that re remind me of like, uh, you have to be confident. That's well, the only reason I'm pausing. I never pause or stumble except uh, when I don't want to like, yes, I'm being very delicate. So I'm, it's not about like writerly overconfidence, but the idea of like a story of this size and these kind of riffs, it reminds me of the way I've been really into comedy lately. Like a lot of people, you know, I tell moth stories, the way long form storytelling works, even though it's really novelistic, but you really build on these riffs, you know, whatever it is, you know, bubble, there's a million things in this book, you know, where you, you take us off on that tangent and then pull us right back. But all these beautiful set pieces, you know, there's a page and a half footnote about the matrix, you know, late in the book where I'm like, Oh, I will go with you there. They just shot the fourth one. So the matrix reference will be back. But, um, Anyway, so yes, I, I guess, do you think about sort of that long form comedic storytelling when you're being a novelist? Are you aware that you're unraveling story in that way where you, you know, take something, you know, what would be tertiary and give it mass and weight and link it to like the heart of your book? Um, I, th I, I think I'm aware. <laughs> I think when, when, I start, when, when I start doing one of those, one of those kind of riffs, um, I usually don't know where it's going. And then, and I discard like a lot of those riffs in the, in the end. Um, but, uh, the, 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 it is my, it's sort of my inclination to write that way. And then to, and then it's my inclination to cut that away. If it doesn't end up feeding plot or forward momentum, whatever we want to call it. Like if it, if it doesn't end up being matterful to the book on the whole, I end up getting rid of it, but I do sort of. I definitely realize that I'm that I kind of go off and come back around like it's circumlocutory. Yes. Is that, is that, is that you yeah. Know? And, and it's uh, and I love uh, I don't get to say lexicon enough when I'm not being writerly. But anyway, but yeah, the uh, also I love uh, your language in this book and the lexicon. And yes, for anyone who reads a thousand page book, for those of who, who build books that there's a two thousand page book. Like it really, you know, it the it just flows. We move through it so nicely. Yes, I can feel the negative space of the absence of the ones that you don't chose. That's something they all that the uh, that you didn't choose. They all go right back. But back to that, you had a big. Uh, I believe the literary term is a big fat doorstop of a novel. I think that's the fancy way to say it. Mm -hmm. And then I love that you didn't do like the you know I did stories and then novel and then anyway. Um, uh, I just was really interesting, uh, interested that you had hot pink in the middle of this. I'm wondering between these two really formidable, like epically structured thousand page books, basically, uh, how you ended up writing a collection of stories and what it feels like for your brain. Because you've already said it. It's like so clearly your brain mapping works this way. It's like when I try to ask anything short or explain anything, you know, God help if a policeman would ever pull me over, they'd be sad for the rest of their life. I'd be explaining for days like. You just, I could see that this is the map of your brain, which I also want to talk about, that it is a character. I want to talk about that space too. But yes, what, what is it like for you to work in the short story form and to be so framed and in that pressurized, rigid, like tight form? I think for me, I mean, I started writing stories first. Like most of Hot Pink was actually before the first novel. That's like, what I was wondering. Yeah. And, and I think actually that it's more, I think one of... I think I'm, I feel comfortable in the story um, because of, because of that pressure. You know, some of my stories run, run long. I mean, they're, they're, they're longer ones and shorter ones yeah, and yeah. You know, officially correctly length, long ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I, I think about writing novels and stories really the same way. I think that's kind of why it takes me so long to write novels because I kind of don't, um, I write very slow. I write very line to line, the same as I would with stories. The same, yes. most, most story writers do this too. Like I don't outline, like I, I go forward and then like sweat what I did and cut most of it and then go forward again. And, and it's, it's, it's actually kind of the same level of intensity for me, for both of them. So right. there's, I think the novels end up having a density that are closer to my stories than I think is often the case with, yeah. with, novels yeah i'm so glad to hear you say that like if you click with a book like it's just wonderful 
Uh, we're not going to talk craft all night. But it's, I remember when I was going to write my novel, like somebody was like, you, you, there's certain writers, say, well, now we don't shake anyone's hands. But like, you can't write a novel with the same care you write a short story. I was like, I think you can. Yeah. Like, if, you, if you work line, like it is just, anyway, that's that process. So um, there's all kinds of, this book has all my favorite stuff in it, all these anxieties where I'm like, I have that anxiety. I have that fear. Um, but, uh, you know, and also the writerly self-deprecation. Uh, we'll get to it. That's a later question too. But there's a, it's every writer's favorite is the compliment that's wrapped that makes you feel really complicated after. There's a wonderful uh, letter to the main character in the book that someone gives and that's like, yeah, I didn't understand most of it. I really liked it. There were great <laughs> swaths of it. I could make no sense of And you're like, uh, thank you. I feel worse than if you yeah. hadn't complimented me, but okay. Um, but oh yes, you give a good, I read uh, interviews too. I did a deep dive. Oh, but you said that this book is based off a failed short story, which I loved whether that, is that so? Is there a 10 page? Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, it's 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 um I wrote it, it was a very failed short story that I was sort of um that that was that featured the narrator and his father in a slightly more extreme form and uh and the narrator has conversations with a couple of inanimate beings including a slide and like some of that is is still in this one scene in the book. Yes. Um and and it was so it so didn't fly like my like my main my main reader since grad school has been this fellow Christian Tabordo and, yeah. and I showed it to him and he's 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 he pulls no punches and he didn't pull any punches there and he was right and and over right. time I just I just kept going back to the idea so um but yeah that that I wrote I think in like 2002 or something and then right. still with me a lot of years later and it was a very big frustration for me and yeah. I found this kind of world to put it in yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, that's also, and again, we have no time for this, but man, do I want to talk about like uh, the subconscious and dissociative states and how things like books are writing themselves, even though the whole process is miserable every single second of it, but they sort of write them. You have these things that fail, in, but they're not failed. They're just cooking. You mm -hmm. know, I love, I love that notion. Um, but you already said, uh, now I want to talk, what is it, Ukrainian? Now I want to talk about that. But you've uh, already, uh, your publicist may be on here and then she'll be like, I'm going to kill Nathan when this is over because we didn't talk about the book. So, oh, let's, I, maybe I could set it up for nine hours. I'm the worst explainer. It'll take longer than the book. But I, uh, I will, yes, let's talk about world building and, and the cure and maybe set up this, this world, which is so smart and gigantically, but yes, is you chronic, what's the word, you chronic? What's yeah, the? Yeah, it's you, I think, I think, yeah, you chronic is the, is the adjective. I think, yeah, you, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, it, yeah, you know? it's yeah. like if your world, if our world fell over and like dislocated its elbow, then it becomes, it's like one step to the side of our world, but it's, uh, yes, I will ask you questions about it. Do you want to set up this world or at least talk about, you know, cures sure. and, yeah, so so I, I think the main the main uchronic thing is that in the eighties in this novel, um, there's this uh, this this corporation starts selling um, this tiny robot that's extremely adorable called a bottomal or a curio, um, and it's it's like this perfect pet. It's a flesh and bone robot that thinks it's your friend. It loves you. It, it has all sorts of advantages over other pets, presumably, such as like its poop smells like bubble gum. It smells like bubble gum. It only eats a very little bit. And all it really needs from you is to um, lay on your arm for a couple hours a day. And it's very, it's very non-intrusive. It weighs, you know, almost nothing. Um, and then it, and then it acts like almost like a little cute person. And it's an extremely adorable, and I don't want to go too much further into it. There's there maybe I mean, it's extremely adorable. People become they 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 want to do things to it, and uh, but so that happens in the 1980s, and this thing becomes so popular that um, the idea is that the internet doesn't get developed because all the people that sort of worked on making the internet building out the internet to what it is because there was some internet in the 80s but building it out to this all-encompassing thing that we have now they all went into like biology and chemistry in order to develop these drugs called formula that you feed to your curio and everyone has a curio everyone's feeding them these drugs doing these things with them and, and they're obsessed with them and they're sort of the internet doesn't develop because there's kind of no need for the internet and yeah and so you live in a world with curios instead of an internet um 
so I read a bunch of reviews and they all talk about, this is obviously the central point, but uh, my brain doesn't work on central points. I'm like, fine, no internet. Like that's not relevant to me. You know, like what I'm interested in is, oh, I really think it's a really feeling book to me. Like I made a note on page eight and then I like, this is not, there is no way to spoil this book in, you know, in terms of spoilers that, I mean, uh, but I won't tell, you know, you don't need to hear about the last pages or whatever, but my note from page eight stayed with me the whole time where I'm like, this is about empathy. Like his first, you know, Belt's first, I didn't see it really anywhere in that way, but I was like, to me, I really felt it, you know, he cares for this, you know, his pet basically, which is, you know, like a biomechanical pet, but right. he, like people become violent towards, there's, it's, you know, it becomes an obsession for it, matches our world very well on how we destroy, you know, it's uh, uh, mice and men. We, we yeah. hug everything to death. Now, don't yeah. we? But, yeah. um, but the point is, I, I really, when I looked at the book, I, it got me interested in empathy and writer's brains, mm -hmm. like specifically, obviously everyone's brains. I'm not saying a writer's brain is specific in being, I can't tell you, the audience can put in the thing, whether I'm being annoying, I can't tell you if I'm annoying, but I'm saying, I am saying, there's chicken and egg stuff with a lot of writers I meet have certain similar personalities, you know, mm -hmm. like just in a type. And I think there's a certain lack of forgiveness. You know, the end of the book is remembering something from childhood, you know, and I was like, I am unforgiving that way mm -hmm. as an adult man with a gray beard. And I'm like, why did I do that in third grade? I should have said this, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I guess I want to talk about empathy because there's a memoir running through here and we could talk about the writer thread. I'll ask two more threads and then we could jump to other places. We're almost out of time anyway. But yeah, could you talk about sort of this, you know, forgiveness for self, for others, caring for this bot? I, I, that's what this book was about to me was this sense of self-forgiveness and trying you know just repair repairing the you know breaking things and then repairing them yeah i mean i'm not i'm not so certain that i thought of it in such in, in those specific in those specific terms but but i i definitely one of the considerations in the book and like it's it's is is whether or not this this bottom or this curio is this is an animal or or a robot right right um and and the thought becomes like like, you know, really that that question is what makes an animal an animal, which is also what makes a human a human, um, and and I think a lot of it has to do with um, what w w whether we have an obligation to empathize or not. You have no obligation to empathize with your computer, right? If your computer breaks, you just get pissed at your computer, and if you don't throw it at a wall it's because it's going to cost money. It's not because you feel for your computer. You, you Maybe some people have sentimentality for their computers. But like, if your pet is annoying you, let alone if your friend is annoying you, you don't yes. strike them. And um, yes. I mean, some people do. This I is going to say. Bad news. Um, but, but, uh, but I think that, that uh, as far as empathy goes, like I don't, that word, the word is really over time, it's become so so broadly used. I'm not, I'm not sure that I that I believe in it as a as a useful force in itself. In fact, I think it's sort of gone back on itself. People yes. sort of stretch to like demonstrate empathy and maybe even feel right, it. Right, right. But it's a bit different than um, as a friend of mine has a. It's a bit different than showing compassion, right? Um, yes. So a lot of the question in the book for Belt, um, and there's a couple of riffs on it. Is you know why why he's kind in one place and not in another why yes. you give money to this homeless fellow and not that homeless fellow why yes. you look out for this group of people but not sex workers what yeah. you know like yes. and, and, and and i think that i, I don't think the, the book at all answers the questions or tries to answer the questions no, I think but, it tries to frame them and, yeah. but it does that's what you know in my like those are the books i like to read is what literature does because i noticed that already like you know, I remember back to, you mentioned a grad school friend. I remember a friend who got mad and punched his Mac. And I remember going, I went, to, bumped into him at the computer store. And he's like, they were like, you punched it right in the hard drive. It's dead. He punched it right in the heart. <laughs> it was, he literally <laughs> killed his computer. But, uh, but I didn't think of him as murderous. But I'm one of those people, it's weird. I'm like, if I was alone in the room and had Siri on my iPhone, I wouldn't say like, oh, what time is it? 1 a.m. I wouldn't be like, fuck you. I was like, that's so weird that I won't, it doesn't have a soul. It's not, it's already animate enough it already has enough of a relationship in my life you know what i'm saying we got back to being a parent now we got rid of all that stuff because you know to see like you know my six-year-old talking to Ro, it's so you know it can wait a minute you know we'd be like hey alexa 
what's for lunch anyway but um anyway yeah i just i found that stuff like about shifting worlds it really you know made me reflect which is what i think uh you know beautiful books do i wish we had the time someone uh, this polish waitress in a coffee shop 20 years ago knew i was a writer and gave me i serve the king of england we have no time to talk about that that's a great book, book. But yeah, so I don't hear about it, but I was like, oh, we're going to be friends. You're like, that's not me again. But back to it not being you, like two more, we're going to take questions in five minutes, put your questions in there. Um, it's going to be moderated. We'll sit back and ask questions. I have 10 million things. Pavement, melon. I want to talk about gum on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I also just explained that to my kid. I was like, get a stick. You'll see it's gum. Anyway, <laughs> those black spots, does anyone not know that all in New York or whatever your city is, all that black spot on the side, it's just gum. Go. That's all that is. Anyway, uh, that's not a spoiler in the book either. Oh, I guess back to how I read also, I'm like, ah, I go to the Russians all the time. I'm like, oh, Turgenev, uh, how about two wild card questions? And then maybe I'll jump in with another one later. But, uh, oh, Quills, you're smoking now. The book is about, it's, it's uh, you know that habit, it's frowned upon. So yeah. um, yes, I'm very interested in owning it in the book. And here, I, I love that, like this, uh, cigarettes or Quills in the book anyway. But um I, all, the father-son stuff is also giant in this book. I really want to talk about the memoir, but to me, it's also a father-son book. It's a beautiful relationship in the book. It's fascinating to me. It, it's real and, you know, layered. But yes, either of those or, you know. Either, okay. either cigarettes or fathers? Cigarettes or fathers. My dad smoked like four packs a day. So to me, that yeah. maybe that's it. Let's have therapy for me right now. The two don't split. Cigarettes and father is one image to me. You never smoked? Uh, no, it, yeah, not really. And Israel probably had a cigarette because they'll kick you out of a taxi or something. But yeah, no, I'm not a smoker. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I mean, um, yeah, my father smoked when I was a kid. Uh, he doesn't smoke anymore. He stopped smoking when I was a kid also. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think the relationship between Belt and his father, I think it's, yeah, I, I thought about that a lot when I was writing it. I, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not my relationship with my father. I have a, I'm very close with my father, but in yes. a, more conventional way um yes. and but but there was a thing i mean i remember when i was a kid and i think i actually maybe like fictionalized the, the father in in my first novel after this is there, there is a very i have a very strong memory of my father in chicago there's a there's um there's lower wacker drive which is like just looks like batman and and a lot, yeah. a lot of Dark night was actually shot there and, right, and right. these on ramps that are like four feet long and you have to get up to 55 and you know, like get in, like merge in, in four seconds. And I, and yes. I have a really strong memory of being like, I was three or four years old and my father driving, we had this, he had this Corolla, like this unair conditioned Toyota Corolla. And we got on lower Wacker and he was lighting a cigarette and driving stick and merging onto lower Wacker. And it was the scariest thing in the world. <laughs> and he totally got us on. And I was like, that's the toughest dude alive. <laughs> I was like, like I, I don't know. And so I think the, there's some, there's something about that, like thinking about the, the, that when I was that person, um, that little person, like being sort of amazed by this daredevilry that right, is right. You know, not necessarily my father's style, like you said, you know, right, right, right. but it was, it was really cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. And I think that with Clyde, with, with the father in the book, um, I was like, maybe he's someone who's, who does shit like that daily. Right, <laughs> um, right, right. I don't know. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a lovely relationship. Maybe we'll do. Um, oh, what about, first of all, uh, two more one second lightning round. Oh, are you like a mimic? And like, you're so good at all the different styles in this book and different kind of, you know, satire. And uh, yes, do you absorb stuff in daily life in that way? You just, just, uh, you're real. It's, it's very chameleon like this book. It just shifts and shifts and shifts and shifts. Like, Thanks, yeah, you know, make that a compliment. The syntax is beautiful. Don't make that a question. Oh, I just want to talk about the weight where it's like when you become a writer and then you just get compared. Does it, um, how do you feel about, uh, you know, like any fat book and they're like, it's David Foster Wallace, it's this, does that, how do you feel uh, about that personally? D does that stuff distract you when you're writing a book this size of, of what comes before or even, you know, do androids dream of electric sheep or if you're going to do panacea, how does what comes this book is, you know, as I said, like just confident and bold. Like if he wants to interview himself in the book, the character, I was like, there's, there, wait, you're just at, you know, I've been writing a long time. Like, are you just going to ask yourself questions and then answer them? I guess we are going to do that now. And it works beautifully. So right. I just wanted to know about like the worlds, which, you know, we're going to make a reference 
we'll either think, you know, uh, you know, 10 movies that we've watched, you know, like just the idea, like furry things, you'll be like gremlins or whatever. Right. How do you put, is it in your head? Are those things floating there? Like the fat book is, you know, infinite jest, which is, they get mentions way too many times. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like infinite jest, your book, but, um, you know, or as I said, you know, do Android's dream, Blade Runner, d were those things weighing, as a neurotic, I'd yeah. like to close with a neurotic question. Sure. Where did you put that stuff when you're building your world and owning it? You really own this world so well. It's one of the strengths of this book. You yeah. have to really own this universe. It's yeah. if any like flag in confidence and this would all come apart. He really, it's just, it's smooth, it's owned, it's, it's beautiful. Anyway, yes, where'd you put all th those other worlds or things that you knew were gonna show up, you know? Well, I, think, I think that I try, like if they occur to me, it, so yes. so it's like I mean there are things there there are references in there like there 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 are aspects of the book that, that I you know books that I think the book is in conversation with as people that's say that's what I'm talking that, about that, in that conversation that, yes. that, that, that don't even get brought up you know yes and like and so I think I'm I'm constantly aware when I'm writing that um I shouldn't say constantly that's ridiculous but I'm often aware like when I'm writing often enough and certainly when I'm when I'm revising that um the book exists in a world of novels that like, like I'm writing, I feel like I'm writing my, my work. The, the stuff I write is for people who love to read books. Like I don't write books for people who need to be convinced that they should read fiction. Like, yes. so I assume that people who read my work want to be reading fiction Oh, nice. That, and that they, and, and maybe they've read some fiction and maybe they haven't. So the only thing that I sweat when it comes to that stuff, like if there's going to be a reference to something, there's going to be a riff on something, like, I don't ever want it to be like there is um, uh, that, that there's prerequisite reading for my novel. Like, I never want I want a book. I want the book to be able to exist in some vacuum, which there's no such thing as. Yeah, but yeah. also like to honor those things that came before it and that informed it and to riff on them. So oh, yeah. that's the way I sort of sweat it is 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 like, can someone who doesn't know anything about like who hasn't read the Isha Guru book or seen the movie? Yeah, 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 yeah. Think about that. Like, like, can will they still? I get it. Just it it's it's but, the second side to the conversation in conversation with all of literature and mm -hmm. then with your audience. I mean, this is as I'm on faculty at NYU, but that's what I talk to my students. Like, you have a carrot peeler, you don't have to explain it. If you want to talk reference like the novel, like Kirbit Kitze, like I was like, you may have to be like, well, there was it's this thing that happened in 19. You know, anyway, right. I'm with you. Yes, it's the double count. What are you obligated in a big world to explain? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Let's, uh, we are right on time or two minutes. Yes, anyway, but uh, I think we're gonna shift to questions now. Um, I have, yeah, maybe you and I'll stay on all night and talk for, I have 11 more hours. I have 11 more pages. All right, everybody, I think we're gonna start with some Q and A. To begin, I would like to give a challenge. Um, can you guys describe your books in five words? Oh, I can't even say hi in five words. <laughs> but uh, literally, it's as I said, everyone cuts me. There's even no way to do it. But um, do you want to go or you want me to? Um, a sad guy has problems. It's four yeah. words, right? <laughs> Yeah. That's funny. That's a big, I make my students do this where I can do it, you know, I can do it for like Anna Karenina. I was like, you know, Prince gets on horse, woman gets hit by train. I can do, <laughs> I can do those with other people's books, but yeah, yes, yeah. I don't know what this is. Cottage, to, I don't even know what this novel's about. Like, you know, ah, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Internet and faith and technology. It's, you know, it's the sun trying to put things right, which is maybe why I'm interested in yeah. that. But it's, it's a about, beautiful book. It was, it was, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Just for those, I, I want to endorse yes. this this book very strongly. It was, yeah, nice. uh, it's my favorite. It's my favorite novel by you. It, oh, that's so nice. All I do is suffer. My family's like, could you take out the dirty parts? I was like, they're relevant. Oh, of course they're relevant. I need you those parts. The dirty parts. Yeah. Anyway. All right. One question from Adam: Your book is different than all the other books I read these days. How did you do that? Um. Well, thank you. I think. Um. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think I, I like I said, I, I as I said to Nathan, I, I, I or and all of you, I guess, I write pretty line to line. Um, and I think maybe maybe what you mean, I don't know, is like my books like kind of not very uh, political. Uh, and so I, I and that's that's pretty deliberate. I'm not real interested in reading politics uh, in fiction that are sort of as, as overt politics in fiction. I, and I'm not very interested in in 
telling you how great you are because you're reading my book. And I think some, I think there was a lot of books doing that now, but I don't think all books are doing that now. So I don't know, but, but thanks. I think that was meant as a compliment. So, you know. Um. All right, let's see, next question. Did anything in your real life inspire your book? Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I, I inspire, no, like I, I don't, nothing, nothing inspires me. I'm an uninspired person. Um, but I think that there are things that happened that like sort of informed the way I thought about things that were going down in the book. So um, I used to be, uh, before, before I went to grad school for the MFA, I got a, a master's in social work and I, I did, I was a psychotherapist. And um, I think I, I, I met a lot of people with chronic mental illness, um, such as the, not, they, they weren't like my narrator, but, but a couple of them had similar symptoms. And, and I think I thought, I thought a bit about them. Um, but other than that, uh, I don't know. And then, well, no, I shouldn't say that. And also I have this parrot and um, I, uh, I, I got the parrot in, I think 2007, which is a couple of years three, five years before I got the book. And, and it sort of changed my outlook on animals. I thought a lot about animals. I, I suddenly cared about animals a lot more. And I thought about why that was. And um, I thought about my feelings for my parrot. I sound very, very soft and sentimental, but, but that's, but, but I, I had these really strong feelings for my parrot. I really, I really like him. And, uh, and I thought that was a strange thing because I, I grew up kind of just not liking animals and avoiding them. And suddenly this, I had this feeling and now I like all animals pretty and the much. the cures go to, they go to like a vet. It's, yeah, they go, they're very bird-like in the, you know, later yeah. in the book and stuff like that. And we're yeah. going to call it an alleged parrot because you keep gesturing, but we've seen nothing. <laughs> but uh, I, I saw Carrie's cat. I know she has a cat. Yeah, I know. But, um, yeah. This bird, yeah. anyway, but, uh, oh, another, just one thing on your answer, which is another part I love about this book. I'm very interested in like the brain and creativity mm -hmm. and that line between madness and creativity. There's this whole thing with inans and, you know, uh, about, you know, hearing things he hears inanimate objects speaking to him, you know, psych psychotic episode type things, mm -hmm. but it really is also like writing books where you're just listening. You know, my one-year-old already says to me, he just screams, wake up. Like I, you know, if I just, if I'm done working and I just start hearing something I need for later, yeah. I just float away. And I was like, <laughs> this book's very gentle. It's really kind to mental illness and to explorations of it. But again, that line with, you just keep thinking about that and creativity in the book in a wonderful way. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad that animals can inspire books. Um, a lot of guys in my family have been the same way. Uh, you know, no, no animals in the house, but as soon as I get an animal, oh man. <laughs> uh, the next question is gonna be from Claire. What happens to your failed short stories that don't later become novels? Do you always finish what you start or do you ever abandon projects in the middle of them? Oh, I abandon. I abandon projects in the middle of them far more frequently than I even get to. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I abandon tons of stuff. And I mean, I think it's, I think I, I, I often, I never think it's like a waste of time because I, I sometimes will go in and like, because usually if I get to the middle of something or what's presumably the middle of something, there's some decent sentences in there that have something that I want to use. And so I'll sort of go in and, you know, pillage them for that. But there's a lot of stuff. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing how many, uh, how many files I have on my computer um, that are just bad. And sometimes when I finish a book, I'll go look through, you know, the last years prior to the year prior to me starting that book, what's in there. And it's, it's, it's almost exclusively garbage. It was like a really good move for me to abandon it. Um, but yeah, but sometimes there's a, there's a line or two that I remember and, and yeah, I take that up. But that's, I really, that's the, I'm really careful. It's the only thing I'm not religious about religion anymore. I'm really religious about writing because mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's torture until you get caught up in a world and then it's like the most ecstatic, like you cease to exist, like more, friends meditate and all this stuff but it's yep. like the freest, the most peaceful, I, I, I cease to exist. Absolutely. But I don't like, you know, sometimes for shorthand, we don't have time to explain what you mean if you say failed or abandoned, but it's just, I don't use those words. I don't believe those world mm -hmm. words. If yeah. I have time, I don't, you know, publicly yeah. say that because it, it's that idea that it, like there is only the process. Like I can't even tell you how much stuff grows. You're just, it is your idea to be present and right, you know, and that's, it, it always, gets it be 
when you when it finds its true form, you understand. Like if a book or if a story needs 172 drafts, like I've drafted stories for years, short stories. I have a short story spent near like a decade on drafting and drafting. But if it needed 172 drafts, like then it makes total sense when something finds its true form. And back to Adam's point, you know, two books ago, Dinner at the Center of the Earth, this book, you know, I, I dreamed about writing it for 18 years or something, you know, like I just, and I built and I built it and it was just missing something at the end. And then I remembered some t attempt from years before I knew just what words, you know, where you're like, it says key and lemon and hamsa and, you know, avocado toast, you know, and you find the file. And I was like, I had to spend all those months, you know, five years ago so that there would be these two paragraphs that I just lifted in put it in, you know, and the editor was like, and now we're done. You know, it's like the scene was white. It's like, it's missing this thing. And I was like, oh, I have that thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I, I'm very religious. It really, the subconscious, it's, it is a, yeah, it, all that, none of the work is for naught, you know. I agree. I agree. And I think sometimes it's just good to, you know, get your ideas out and then find the idea that works. Um, let's see. Another question is, do you hide any Easter eggs in your books for people to find? I, I mean, Easter eggs, like that's like that thing where on the DVD, like yeah. on the Earn front thing, yeah. it's like a thing if you click on it by accident, there's like a little anime of the, yeah. um, I mean, in that sense, I guess not, there's no anime in my book, but like, but I definitely um, try to write the books and the stories for that matter, so that they bear up the second and third time, like that they bear up more, more meaning they bear, they, they resonate more when you reread them. I know that's asking, you know, with long book, um, asking someone to read it a second times a lot. So I try to, you know, make it work the first time, but, but I want it to, I, yeah, I want the, I want there to be stuff that the second time through the third time through, um, you go, Oh, you know, holy shit. I, I missed that the first time. I, I always like that when I read books like that, it's not, it's not so much like I deliberately do it. Like I say, I'm going to put an Easter egg here or whatever, as I say to myself, like, okay, this works well enough in the scene and this will be really cool if someone reflects back on it or rereads it again. So I'll yeah. keep it in. Like, yeah. I think I'm glad you said back to being delicate about words. Like Easter egg is the exact right thing to call it, but not with the intention of like bonus material. But I right. think that's right. It goes back to what we were saying before about things being, uh, everyone needing access to everything. But I'm saying I read, you know, a bunch of Cormac McCarthy, like, I don't know what a horse I know. I say they're like big dogs to me. So I'm like, I'm, I assume someone who lives in like Santa Fe or, you know, Texas and rides as a ranch gets yeah. a whole different read. You know, I just see bushes and big dogs with people on them, you know, mm -hmm. but so that same way, like everyone back to this last book, it is such a, like I studied, I went so deep on like Jewish law and things like that. I, it's like, I, I really believe in, if a work is not functioning, if it's not universal, it's an utter failure. You know, like if someone can't read it, who's never met a Jew or whatever, like then it's not, that's what books do is we enter other worlds. Like that's the point, you don't need a cure. You don't have to have your own one at home to understand the book. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, there's things that are like, so I just know they're hidden that they're referenced so, so deep. And it's beautiful to me as like the decades go by every few years, someone's comes and like, asked me about some moment and something and I was like I say like I've been waiting for you yeah. like no one yeah. no one can I tell what we have, I'll tell really one second oh th there's a story I have that references um everything I know about my family on my mother's side uh what's it in well it's in a collection anyway but uh oh I was raised to you know we're from Gabernia like which you know that's where my family's from in Russia Gabernia 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 uh, point is we're not from Russia and neither is Gabernia just means state like county so all that was remembered so it's like being from New York State or from you know whatever just from a state and I was reading in San Francisco this woman must have been like 75 or something and she comes up to me and she at the end she's like I am from Gabernia too like she like just to meet someone who their whole life thought they're from a place that is no place we really yeah. hugged back when you could hug, we really hugged like relatives. Like I met someone else from my village, state, yeah. county. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's see, Jonathan says, the protagonist of this book is insecure while the protagonist from the instructions is confident. Yet both books have a very similar voice. 
To what do you attribute this, if anything? Um, well, it's interesting that that the he's saying the books have similar voices. I um I kind of think the voices are different. It, it, I guess I guess they're both monologuing. They're both kind of written as books. The 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 narrator acknowledges their books, but I think that um what what I attribute to there, there's one sort of I guess as as close to deliberate as I can be is that in the instructions um. The narrator Gurian is extremely active, and like this, my my my, you know, it's my first book, and one of the sort of tenets I was trying to stick to was that all action arises through him. Like he causes everything in the book, um, for for better and worse, and he's he's the he's completely non-passive. And then Belt, I, and after doing that for ten years, I, I I wanted to I wanted to think about what a passive, what a more passive narrator looked like, and Belt's pretty passive. Like he has his, he has a couple moments, but um, the world is happening to him a lot more than the world is happening to Gurian. In the instructions, Gurian's kind of making the world. And in, in, in um, Bubblegum, Belt is kind of suffering the world. Um, so, so I think, I think that, was, that was relatively deliberate in a general way in that, in that I, didn't want, um, I didn't want a guy who every time I started thinking we need some action here could punch someone in the face, which is kind of what the instructions was, um, you know. Yeah. Let's see. Another question is, was there a particular moment or inspiration that prompted you to choose the name John Boat for that character? And have you ever been in a John Boat? I've never been in a John Boat. Um, I think that I was like, I thought a lot about those names just as like, in terms of just, just for comedic value. Like, I think it's like, I think it's a really silly name to have. And it sounds to me like the name that someone from a sort of social circle that I literally will never be able to penetrate would have. Like the fourth son named John or whatever, um, who I've, I've never known someone like that. In grad school, I learned, um, and I think probably most people know this, I didn't know this, that like, if you're if you're the son of a junior and you get the junior's name, your nickname is often Trip, and if you're the fourth one, you're Flip, and like I, and I I don't know I just I just thought John Boat sort of I, it seemed really silly to me and and so so I wanted to do it I want like I want I like the sound of John Boat it's sort of punchy and um it's he just sounds like the worst guy to me John Boat I, I don't know like uh, as as a name I, I don't know. And that's always fun to have names that you don't see every day. <laughs> um, here's an interesting question. If you had to write a book about an inanimate object, what object would you choose and why? I mean, I, I, I guess a, a swing set. I don't know. I mean, because that's sort of <laughs> that's sort of what happened. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, probably a swing set. And why? Uh, because I don't, I don't want to write another one of those books, and so I already did it. So I could just say, I "Should read Bubblegum." Uh, there's, this is, you know, there's inanimate objects like swing sets that talk. And what inspired you to start writing stories? I, again, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that anything inspired me. I love reading stories, and I loved, I loved reading fiction um, since I was a little kid, and, and so I wanted to do that. I, and I think that, you know, for a long time, I, I guess like the short of it is I was always doing that and I wanted to be a rock star because who doesn't? And so I played, I played music for a while in high school in the beginning of college. And then I just had one day, um, I played bass, which is like a very useless thing to do if you can't do anything else and I couldn't do anything else. And there was a day when we had a practice and everyone was late and I was really aggravated. And I just thought, I, why the fuck am I waiting for other people to make stuff like and, and, and I and I sort of stopped and and I just and I started writing every day for a number of hours because it you know it brought me pleasure it was you know something to do at the coffee shop it was really inexpensive and I liked doing it it was it was something to do when I wasn't reading or you know doing drugs or whatever um so yeah, yeah that's such a good I I really do think it's like such a subversive form that like that idea where it's like I'm always fascinated by like friends who are like film directors they're like I just thought all I need is a million dollars a day and like 700 people. And I know some people who like can't even talk at a party. 
And I was like, but if they're directing a film, I was like, you can't even order coffee. How can you possibly have like, oh, I'm 10 minutes late. That was $74,000. But I was like, I really love that idea. Same thing. I wanted to make stuff. I really thought I, I uh, did you all see my second play? Just kidding. It uh, didn't get to open, but hopefully next year. But uh, we were just about, anyway, well, it's a separate matter. But, um, but yeah, I've, I've written two plays now. Um, uh, one is, you know, frozen because of this year. But yeah, like I, I think I wanted to write plays at the start. I was like, where am I going to get people in a barn, you know, a stage, to, you know, who's going to need outlets? But yeah, I love that idea that when you're like, I'm going to world build, it's like, I just need, you know, something, a piece of coal. Yeah. I also I also like the idea that it's because you're uh, one is allergic to management that you write books. Oh, like, I'm, I don't I'm want to manage people. Yeah. I just want to, I just, just let me do my shit. Like, yeah, a thousand percent. I yeah. don't know how to delegate or get anything done or yes, I'm super with you on that front too. Just like to mumble in a coffee shop, which I can't <laughs> wait to start doing again. Yeah. I've started after like 15 or it was maybe like 15 years in. I'm like, I think I need an office now. I think I go so deep. I think I must just be mumbling and chatting there and laughing to myself. I have no idea what happens. I was like, maybe this should be done in private at this point. <laughs> that's when I got offices. <laughs> nice. And that's great that, you know, wanting to make something turned into you actually making something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's see, Jonathan has another question. Um, do you have a favorite comedian? Um, yeah, I, a favorite, I mean, it, it's really, I have, a, there's a lot of comedians who, who I adore. Um, and it, I guess it depends how you define comedian. If I had to like pick a number one favorite, it's Chaplin. Um, you know, uh, cause Chaplin actually like, you know, makes me cry like a, you know, three-year-old like, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you mean stand up, um, I know it's I'm not supposed to say it, but I, I'm a pretty huge fan of Louis C.K. Um, and Seinfeld. I mean, I like typically like I'm I'm pretty. I think I'm I, I like uh, I like most sort of darker comedians. I guess what people call darker comedians. But I really my my sort of the thing that my heart opens up for um, are these sort of old slapstick guys. So I love Groucho. I love the Marx. But like like again like of the Marx Brothers. You know, if you had to pick a Marx brother, I pick Harpo. Um, but you, you know, it's like that's my favorite Marx brother. I guess that 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 probably says more than anything. Uh, you know, if you have a favorite Marx brother, it's, it's Harpo. So you know, um, if everything could be Harpo, it'd be a nice world. <laughs> as long as you have comedy. That's your charming <laughs> memoir title. If everything could be Harpo. Gonna... <laughs> um, if you could change the direction that you chose to go, how and what would you change? The, the the direction of my life um of your book oh of my <laughs> book oh i don't think i would change anything um i i mean i, I don't want to sound cocky but i mean like i i like i sweat like every comma so it's 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 uh i mean if i thought i would want to change anything i'd, I'd be I'd, I'd be jumping off a bridge right now oh this is why yeah this is why we virtually get along he's like if i could change one thing about life i never would have lied about having that parrot <laughs> it's gotten so complex at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get yeah. out of it. Um, but uh, oh yeah, but that's it. I like tell my students. I was like, "Do you want to be famous for having the world's youngest and worst debut?" I was like, Fit, "Like, don't put anything out there. No one's waiting for anyone's first book or anyone <laughs> after that. Like, if you're gonna need to change something, keep it in the drawer. Like, that's that's yeah. it. I'm super with you on it. When it, yeah, I know certain. There's all different kinds of writers, but like yeah, there's the type where it's like just you know, put it out there. And then after, like, I have friends who like slap their head and be like, oh, you know what, like, I, I, wasn't, I just, you know, yeah. and then there are the people who go back in and like make tweaks with, you know, every print one, which is my kind of compulsion, though I yeah. try to avoid yeah. it. Like that's, that's when it's, I like, I try to remind myself, uh, you've got the bookstore, like you literally sell your books. Like I don't own them anymore. Like that's such a nice thought to me. Like I make them some, if someone buys them, it is not my, like, I better be done. And then, if, and then if someone buys the book from you, you know, like, that's it. I have my copy of Bubblegum. It's mine. It's not Adam's anymore. He can't even tell me what to see in it. I saw right. Sufjan's right. name. Hello, Sufjan. You're here. Hey, friend. Nope. It popped up. And Sufjan also says, you mentioned you tried to avoid all politics and fiction. What are your thoughts on politics in literature? Oh, that's, that's such a broad question. I, I, I like, I mean, 
I don't know that I have any coherent thoughts. Like I, I'm, I, I like, I basically just want to write the kind of book that I want to read. And generally, um, I don't mind thinking about politics. I'm not so crazy about the way we've come to talk about politics all the time, but I used to not mind talking about politics, but I, I want in, in fiction, um, I want to be able to uh, not have to be, when I'm reading fiction, I want to not be thinking um, about how, what a character is doing um, or what the writer th might think he's doing with the character relates to who anyone's going to vote for or any action anyone's going to take. Like this is like on, on, a, on a political scale, on a larger scale, I'm just not, that's not what I go to fiction for. It's not, it's not what I go to art for. Like, I think that um, politics might be a worthy endeavor sometimes, um, even often, uh, but not, 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 not in fiction for me. It's just not to my, it's not to my liking. I can't think of a book that ever um, changed my mind or made me think differently about politics. Um, I can definitely think of books that when I read them, make me more likely to be kind to people, um, make me more likely to uh, sort of critique myself. And they're not, um, they're not books that have, that, that have much to do with politics. That said, maybe what I consider political fiction or uh, what I've caught, what I'm thinking of as political fiction is only the tip of the iceberg because now I'm saying it, it's like, Bend in the River by V.S. Naipaul. I love that novel. Like, I love, I love, you mentioned Cormac McCarthy. I love Blood Meridian. If those are considered political fictions, I love them. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, but, but no, they're not, they're not, that's not their point. Their point isn't yeah. to make an argument for, for a certain um, political point of view. Their point is to be a novel first. Um, and that other stuff comes, I mean, would, would you agree, Nathan? Are yeah, you, I was going to say, as your attorney, I was going to start speaking for you right now. <laughs> But like on that note, uh, wait, where did you get your MFA? Where? Uh, Syracuse. Oh, okay. I saw, I was like, I was wondering, but I'm reading the, I thought so and I hadn't confirmed, but yeah. I, I'm reading the uh, George's, George Saunders is the book on stories. And it's like, so it's off. so heartening to me because I'm like, I deeply believe this. And now he's quoting Chekhov as deep. Like I scream the same thing to my students that he screams, to, like, it's so beautiful. Like there it's, it's fiction, it's infinite, whatever, there is a working sentence, there is a right and wrong, it's infinite, but there's a way, there's things that the craft demands. And I feel like that's what you're saying, which is like, your nature is your nature. Like, I don't think of myself as, you know, it like bleeds in there. I always use Orwell as the example. If anyone else tried to write like any kind of Orwellian book, it'd be horrible. It'd be didactic and a fucking lecture, but he's just innately, his nature is political. Like that's the point you're making at Blood Marine. If it gets in there, like if, if it is your head, it can be your head, but if it's not your head, it would be crazy and feel like a lecture. And I also love your point about staying outside of time. Like even if you are being political in that way, like even setting wise that, you know, like if I like have some whole 900 page book that I finally just finished about like Bella Abzug's hats, you'll be like, Bella, who, you know, like we're beyond, the, you know, so I think it's, in the moment when you're enraged about something, but you can, like, as I said, if you're exploring politics as story, it becomes something else. Right, right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See, another question. Um, what is your writing setup like? Do you have to have a certain setup? Do you have to listen to certain music? Uh, I'm jumping on that because it's so funny in this terribly painful, unfunny year. I had a nine hour list to tell you of the exactly only way I could work in under those circumstances and to have them all stripped away is just uh, just shocking. But then one one still works. That's what is the it? point. Uh, huh? Which is the one that works? I'm just saying what like, oh, I meant one a person. I still have to work. Oh, one still you know, <laughs> yes, I used to have time say like then schools were closed. I was like, I'm going to write without time. You know what I'm saying? I need quiet. I'm going to write with noise. You know, yeah. like I need people. I always, I had a shared off it, the wonderful novelist, John Ray, but I had a, like this wonder, you know, we had his house, you know, just, you know, Marlon James in one room and, you know, Akil Sharma, like we just all these writers working together, but separate, like I need people. And I was like, I will work without people except my beloved wife. She's like, you haven't been alone this year. You're in a house. Anyway, but yes, I mean, the, the, yeah. I've been stripped of my writer world that feeds. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, uh, unbroken time would be the main 
the yeah. main ingredient. It's, I need a block of time. You, Adam? Yeah, no, un unbroken time is, 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 the, is the main ingredient. And um, for me, like I, I definitely, when I was younger, I used to write in coffee shops. Then when Me I went to love get, that. Yeah, it was, it, it now I kind of, I had a weird thing. It, like, like, cause I, I, once I, once I went to get my MFA, I started writing alone in my apartment and I became this like very sort of rigid person that I still mostly am, which is like first thing in the morning for as long as I can go. And I used to write in the afternoon too, right. and on my back, but like first thing in the morning, I, eat, you know, a few almonds and then it's like, espresso and cigarettes and um and i thought that was it and, that, and now this is my life and i did that for years and then and then i went to promote bubble gum in france and it was weird it came out there first um and and so and and i went to this cafe and i started writing in a notebook which is like completely strange for me it was something i hadn't done in years i have no handwriting i now write in all caps and um so now i really like doing that but apparently it, it only works in france when like I can watch people and not understand what they're saying because I don't yeah. speak French. Um, and uh, so that's a really nice thing. So there's two modes. It's 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 that. It's like, yeah, in the morning, first thing, or in France when I can watch French people. Uh, and yeah. Write your book. yeah. It's routine. Uh, yeah, routine would be the main. <laughs> like that's I th I always compare it to like you know re any kind of religious practice or yoga. But yes, it's all. I really do think one trains the brain. Like you can train your brain to be creative. I agree. I agree. And I think one more question to wrap it up. Um, are you both working on anything currently? Um, I just, I just uh, finished a book. Uh, it should be out like end of next summer, beginning of next fall, I think. Uh, and now I'm working on like 50 things and one of them is going to be the thing, hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later. So I'm getting a little crazy, but uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I usually have like five or 10 years between, but I did back to back books and then the play. It was very strange because I was supposed to be involved with this thing. You know, it was just a, a real shock to the system to be like, uh, I usually plan ahead. I wasn't, uh, I guess if any of us were prepared, we would have warned the other people to get prepared, put a mask on. I would have told you yeah. two years ago. But nonetheless, I do wear your masks. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, just exactly where Adam is. Like, I haven't been not deep in something in like years. So just fiercely working on 300 things that, you know, it's just funny, it's sweet. I, like, uh, not that I am sweet, I'm saying I was jumping to students without telling you about the students, but that's it. Like I love when, or just friends, when they're deep, when a friend's deep in their book, they'll be like, oh my God, I ran out of tinfoil. And then I saw the empty tube and I finished my book as if everything's a miracle. So once you get lit, then you're like, uh, you know, just anything. I stub my toe and that, I was like, that's what I need. Like just, yes, right now, everything seems terrifying and then five things will seem exciting and then one, and then I just start, then you start talking to everyone you know about some weird subject you're obsessed with that they're like, oh, we're back to 1927. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so we had some really great questions and even better answers. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for coming uh, tonight and supporting Adam and Nathan. And thank you both for entertaining us today. Um, everyone can go to the links that are provided in the chat or go to writersblockbookstore.com and order a copy of Bubblegum and Kadash.com. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Carrie. And Nathan, thank, thank you, so Carrie. Oh, my pleasure and congrats on paperback launch. Yay. Adam. Thank you. I think, I think we're still alive. <laughs>